Our message this morning was prepared by Pastor Thompson. Are you a lover of money? I asked you this question in the sermon last week. This week, Jesus is finishing his teaching about worldly wealth and possessions with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And there are three main takeaways we are going to focus on this morning. One, the focus of the story is Lazarus. Two, God measures righteousness by faith, not by worldly measures of success. Three, you have been given all that is needed to repent in faith. These three teachings of Jesus will demonstrate why worldly possessions are not our hope and reveal where our hope truly resides. Our first takeaway is that the focus of the story is Lazarus. This is the first thing that stands out in the story. Despite the amazing life of the rich man, he is feasting every day, he probably has connections and high status in his community. In other words, he would be the known character. In contrast, despite all that, excuse me, despite all that, Jesus does not give him a name. In contrast, Jesus names the beggar Lazarus. This would be recognized immediately as an odd detail in the story. After all, Jesus could have said a certain rich man and a certain poor man, but Jesus instead gives the poor man a name, Lazarus, and the name Lazarus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Eliezer, which means the one whom God helps. By giving the poor beggar a name, Jesus is teaching that the person the world ignores and despises is the focus of the Savior. Another way we know that Jesus is highlighting Lazarus is in the structure of the story itself. This structure is called a chiasm. In a chiasm, you have framed parallel statements, A, B, C, and C, B, A, and there's a slide that we have that does show this structure. You can see the relationship between these parallel statements in Jesus' account. A chiasm structure is used to draw the focus to the central statements in it. As you can see, the central statements in this one are all about Lazarus. Clearly, Jesus intends Lazarus to be the focus of the story. By highlighting Lazarus, Jesus intends to teach the Pharisees, the lovers of money, and his disciples that God sees things differently. He doesn't measure righteousness in the way that the world does. The world notices the rich man and overlooks Lazarus. Jesus is teaching that God has focused his attention on Lazarus. We get to the end of this first part and what happens? Both characters in the story die. Once again, Jesus highlights Lazarus. He is carried to heaven to Abraham's side. The rich man, by contrast, simply dies and is buried. No mention of a grand funeral or all the expected things to be concerned with when a wealthy and important person dies. Jesus simply states, the rich man also died and was buried. The presence of death highlights the uselessness of worldly wealth. Jesus has repeated this teaching many times in Luke. Worldly possessions do nothing for you when death comes. It turns out, according to Jesus himself, that worldly wealth doesn't earn or demand the attention of God, nor can we purchase his aid. Next, we come to the post-death scene of heaven and hell. Here, the rich man is in hell being tormented, and he sees Lazarus resting at Abraham's side in heaven. To get the full effect of this scene, we're going to highlight some easily overlooked details. The rich man addresses Abraham as Father Abraham. This detail indicates that he is Jewish and is aware of the history of his people. Jesus intends the Pharisees, who are eavesdropping on Jesus' teaching, his disciples, to identify themselves with the rich man. He wants to draw them away from their love of money and into faith in him. The second detail is the rich man in his address to Abraham identifies Lazarus by name. He knew him by name, that is easy to overlook. And it, it, this, this detail eliminates the idea that the rich man and those like him 
don't notice what God is pointing out. The rich man knew Lazarus was at his gates and was aware enough of him to know his name, yet he ignored his suffering and need. The rich man's speech also demonstrates that he does not recognize that Lazarus is no longer a needy beggar. He still views him as a servant. He still is looking at things through the eyes of the world and not as God sees it. He demonstrates his blindness by asking Abraham to send Lazarus to fetch water for his tongue. And again, when he later requests, to, he be sent to his brothers to warn them. Both requests indicate that even amid hellish torment, the rich man's self-righteousness is still not fully recognized. By the way Jesus describes the picture and posture of Lazarus and Abraham, he indicates the error of the rich man. The sense of the Greek of the phrase translated in our reading as at his side in verse 23 indicates that Lazarus is reclining with Abraham only a guest of honor at the heavenly feast would be able to recline at the side of Abraham. The rich man is still blind to how God sees people. Earthly station and wealth don't matter. Lazarus couldn't do great deeds or give away great wealth, yet now he sits in a high place of honor at the Lord's table. Does money matter to God? Turns out that he meant it when he said, the last will be first, and the first shall be last. Lazarus, the least, has been exalted to the place of honor. How does one such as Lazarus get to this place of honor? After all, now that we have the eyes of faith, we recognize we are just like Lazarus, beggars in need of complete help from God. Here, the meaning of the name Lazarus, the one God helps, gives us the clue we need to understand the answer to this question. Jesus is revealing that God wants to help the poor and destitute of the world. And what does that require? Nothing. Nothing but faith in him. Lazarus couldn't do anything. He couldn't even prevent the dogs from licking his sores. He was totally helpless. He could only rely on God's faithfulness and mercy. How do we get this faith and how does God help us? Abraham's answers to the rich man's requests reveal the answers to these questions. Abraham's first answer, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. This answer highlights that the time for repentance is past. This is signified by a great chasm that prevents the crossing between the place of comfort and torment. Finally, this reality finally causes the rich man to think of someone other than himself. And he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers so they might avoid coming to that place of torment. Abraham's second answer is where we find out how all this righteousness and faith actually works from God's perspective. Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they already have the word of God and his testimony about himself. In response to this, the rich man argues quite rationally that they won't pay attention to Moses and the prophets. The scrolls of scripture are not attention grabbing enough to tear his family away from their life of comfort and wealth. But, the rich man argues, surely a resurrected man would get their attention. That would certainly create faith in them. We sometimes make a version of this argument ourselves, namely, that we would believe something if Jesus was there to tell us, or if we saw the same thing the Israelites saw in Egypt. But Abraham's response tells us otherwise. He says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now you might be thinking, is that really true? I think I would be convinced if a resurrected man, someone I knew was dead, came back to life to tell me about Jesus. So what are we to make of this? 
Here we turn to our third takeaway. Jesus is making an extremely important point. In God's word, you have been given all you need to have faith. He also is teaching that if you think the scriptures are insufficient, if you need additional proof, no additional proof will convince you. In other words, God's word is the only thing capable of creating faith. No external signs or proofs will succeed where it fails. Even if someone who is dead comes back to life, this exchange also points us to Jesus' own death and resurrection. Even with his resurrection and the account of the witnesses he appeared to, a witness they were willing to suffer death rather than renounce, many people still don't receive the word of God and believe. Many still won't be convinced. Many still demand more proof. Even though a resurrected man has indeed come to bear witness about God. To those who follow Christ, what are we to do with this? Receive the word of God in faith. In it, you have greater treasure than any of the rich man. Your hope is in the abundant and gracious help of God, not the false security of worldly goods. Like Lazarus, God has come to help you. And when he does, sorrows turn into joy, suffering into comfort, and finally, death into life everlasting. No worldly status or wealth or possessions needed. In fact, the fate of the rich man warns us to guard ourselves from the temptation of worldly wealth and its tendency to replace God in our hearts. You, the helpless beggar, are the focus of God. God's vision of worth and righteousness is one of compassion that grants righteousness on account of Christ's work, not our own. And all that is needed is to have faith in him, and this you have already been given by his word. A faith born from the very word of God you hear today, the very word that created all things, created faith in you. It sees the forgotten and struggling sinner as the object of God's compassion and love. It grants you the very righteousness of the Son of God, Jesus, as a free gift of love. His word is continually and daily offered to you to nourish your repentant faith until we, like Lazarus, are brought home to recline at the table of God with Abraham and all other believers in Jesus. Now in Christ, you are guests of honor, invited to the eternal table of the Lord. Amen.